The valid risk and the expected shortfall are two very important risk measures that are extremely used and abused, as I already told you, in risk management. They are so widespread used because within the Basel framework, as we shall see when dealing with market risk, credit risk and operational risk, actually banks are supposed as an intermediate step towards the computation of the capital requirements for the different types of risk, they are supposed to compute the valid risk and the expected shortfall. So the Basel framework, this set of regulations that we will consider in more details later in the course, uh, the Basel framework describes, requires and prescribes the use of both the valid risk and the expected shortfall. Now, from a statistical point of view, these two quantities are just very basic objects. Don't be fooled by the fancy names that come just from the fact that in finance we like to give fancy names to objects, so it's a sort of jargon, but from a statistical point of view, the valid risk is nothing more than a quantile, so if you know what a quantile is, you know what valid risk is. And the expected shortfall is a conditional expectation, is the expected value of all the losses that lie above the valid risk. So if you want, is a tail expectation. Now, in the next minutes, I will go very quickly through the basic and most important things that we have to know about valid risk and expected shortfall. I will give a lot of things for granted, but if you do not feel familiar with these topics, I'm very happy to refer you to a couple of classes that I recorded for my bachelor course in risk management within the minor finance. And there I treat both the valid risk and the expected shortfall at a lower level of sophistication. Uh, but it can be a nice uh, introduction if you want. And at the same time, it also shows a lot of exercises and computations, so it can be helpful if you don't feel familiar with quantiles and conditional expectations that nevertheless, I hope, is not the, the case. Because in this course, as you will see, we give quite some knowledge for granted. Now consider a loss distribution. So a loss distribution is a distribution that gives us how the possible losses of our portfolio, of our investment, are distributed. Remember once again that for us losses are positive and profits are negative. So above zero we can read the actual losses, below zero we find the profits that for us are negative losses. Okay, assume that we have a loss distribution. Now, this distribution, as we shall see, can be a theoretical distribution coming out of a model like, say, the normal distribution, the Pareto distribution, the log normal distribution, or it can be an empirical distribution, so a distribution that we will compute from data empirically. So if you want, we start with the histogram, then with the ECDF, and so on, in the usual way as we do when we play with actual data. Now, once we have this distribution, the valid risk is nothing more than the alpha quantile of that distribution, where alpha is nothing more than the confidence level that we choose for the valid risk. So, a typical example of valid risk is the 95% valid risk, so alpha is 95% or 0.95, or the 99% valid risk, where alpha is 99% or 0.99. We even have 99.9%, .9%, which is prescribed by the Basel framework. Now, once we have the 95% say valid risk, what is valid risk? Valid risk is nothing more than the quantile of the loss distribution that the value of the losses such that 95% of the losses we can expect from our investment will be lower and only 1 minus alpha, that is to say 5% in this situation, will be larger. So you see, it's just a quantile. 
once we fix a probability that for, for us will be the alpha confidence level, then we look for the quantile that corresponds to the value such that the losses I can expect from my portfolio are smaller than or equal to that value with the alpha probability, and only a probability 1 minus alpha of line above. Okay, so that's very simple. Once we have computed the valid risk out of our loss distribution, we might be interested in knowing something more about losses that lie above the valid risk, that is to say the larger losses, those that are riskier for us. Why that? Consider a very simple example. Imagine we have a portfolio that might generate different losses and we have computed 95% valid risk for that portfolio. And we know that valid risk is 10 million euros. Okay? Now, at the 95% confidence level, it means that if we look at losses of our portfolio, only 5% of the losses will be larger than 10 million euros. Fine. But you understand that larger than 10 million euros, even if we know that such an event can happen only with a 5% probability, can actually represent many different situations. More than 10 million euros can be 11 million euros, but it can also be 27 billions. Okay, so having a better uh, understanding of what happens above the valid risk can be extremely uh, useful for us. Actually, it is vital. Okay, now the risk measure that helps us in answering this question is essentially the expected shortfall. The expected shortfall is nothing more than a non-centered expectation of all the losses that lie above uh, a given valid risk. So if I compute the expected shortfall at level alpha, this is nothing more than the expected value of all the losses that lie above the var alpha, so the valid risk at the same level alpha as that that we are considering for the expected shortfall. So it is trivial to observe that when we fix an alpha level, the expected shortfall can never be smaller than the corresponding valid risk, okay? Because it's the expectation of all the losses above, okay? We shall see that expected shortfall is very, very connected with a quantity that in extreme value theory is known as the mean excess. Here on your screen, you can see the very simple mathematical definition of the expected shortfall as a conditional expectation. For the moment, we are not considering what is the probability measure that we are using to compute this expectation in most situations. will be the physical measure, but obviously we can also try to find other appropriate measures. The use of the expected shortfall within the financial regulations like, for example, the Basel framework, but also IFRS 9, has increased over time. Uh, for example, in Basel 2, the expected shortfall was not so relevant and the most important measure was actually the valid risk. Then, a lot of people and practitioners in particular discovered that the valid risk had and has problems and that the expected shortfall can be a viable alternative. So now, for example, in Basel 3, uh, the expected shortfall has gained much, much more importance. Now, again, why do we need actually both measures? Because the valid risk gives us a threshold and the expected shortfall tells us what possibly might happen above that threshold. Obviously, the expected shortfall is an expectation, so in principle we could think of other additional tail measures to understand better what happens in the tail, so in the part of the distribution that lies above the valid risk. For example, we could think of a conditional variance, and actually in the literature you can find something like that. But as I will stress more and more when we deal with extreme value statistics, Playing with higher moments, like the second moment, that is to say the variance, the third moment, and then the skewness, the fourth moment, and then the kurtosis in the tails is not very wise, because tails are tricky objects, and there is no guarantee that the theoretical moments we are essentially relying upon 
actually exist, that is to say, are finite. I'm not speaking about the sample moments, those are always finite, but the theoretical ones, the one of the possible distribution of the generator of the losses, might be not finite. And if the theoretical moments are not finite, the sample moments are not reliable because they cannot be used for inference purposes. They are just numbers that are extremely erratic and volatile and not at all uh, reliable. So there are alternatives. So some authors, um, I'm one of the authors, have proposed alternative measures like the conditional Gini, given uh, birth to the so-called concentration profile. So there are alternatives, but this part of risk management is still a quite active field of research. Let's say that if we want to just focus our attention on what is used every day by practitioners and what is prescribed every day by financial regulations, the very risk and the expected shortfall are the de facto standard. It should be no surprise to observe that two different portfolios may have the same valid risk for a given alpha level, but different expected shortfalls. Why? Because of the different tail behaviors. So using the two measures together is extremely important. Never, never, never just rely on the value at risk, because otherwise you might think that two different investments have the same level of risk when this is not completely true. If not, absolutely not true. Putting any financial interpretation on the side for a minute is not difficult that, mathematically speaking, the connection between the expected shortfall and the valid risk is extremely clear, as you can see on your screen. In terms of axiomatic properties, it's not difficult to verify that the expected shortfall is always a coherent risk measure, and I leave the proof to you. It's extremely simple. The expected shortfall is, at the end of the day, an expectation, and proving the different four properties is very simple. Conversely, for what concerns the valid risk, it is not true that the valid risk is, generally speaking, coherent. For observing that, let's just consider a very simple example. To simplify things, at least initially, let's consider two independent portfolios of bonds. They both have a probability of 2% of a loss of 10 million pounds and a probability of 98% of a profit of 1 million over a one year time window. Okay, so remember that for us a profit of 1 million is equal to a loss of minus 1 million. Now the question is what is the joint VAR of a portfolio combining these two independent portfolios? Now the first thing that we can do is to compute the valid risk of each single portfolio. And we discover that, for example, at the 97.5% confidence level, the value is 1 million profit for each of the two investments. So if you want, in both cases, the valid risk is a loss of minus 1 million. For what concerns the joint valid risk, conversely, it is not difficult to see that the joint valid risk is 9 million. So what happens? We have that jointly the two investments have a valid risk of 9 and 9 is for sure not smaller than minus 1 plus minus 1, that is to say minus 2. So what happens? At the end of the day we have that creating a portfolio that combines these two independent investments gives a valid risk which is higher than the sum of the valid risks of the single portfolios. In other words, in this very basic example, the valid risk is not subadditive. If you're not familiar with these type of exercises and computations, please have a look at my basic course in risk management. you find the link now on the screen. There you can find many examples and simple analysis for very basic situations. There are obviously situations in which, on the contrary, the valid risk is coherent. 
A simple example is the case of normality. If the loss distribution follows a normal distribution, then the valet risk is coherent. And as we shall see in the application uh, with R, I will show you what is the actual formula for the valet risk of a normal distribution, but I guess you know it because if you, if you are able to compute the quantiles of a normal distribution, then you know the valet risk. Okay the valid risk and the normality is coherent. So please try to show it. You will see that very simply also using what we know about the coherence of the standard deviation, we can show that the valid risk and the normality is subadditive. So at the end of the day, all the other properties are uh, satisfied and it is coherent. Another example is all relaxation of normality. So if instead of just a normal distribution, especially in the multivariate framework, we consider elliptical distributions, also there we have that the valid risk is coherent. Finally, a third example is the case of a so-called comonotonic portfolio. That is to say a portfolio in which all the different assets, all the risks of the different assets can be expressed as linear combinations of one or more of the assets. So we have a portfolio in which essentially there is a very strong linear dependence among the assets and every asset can be expressed as a linear combination of essentially one of the other assets, but under further uh, restrictions we can also consider a little bit more assets. Okay, under a comonotonic portfolio, uh, the valid risk is uh, once again uh, subadditive and so also coherent. But you can understand that having a comonotonic portfolio in terms of diversification is not really the, the best because you have a portfolio in which the different assets tend to move in the same uh, direction, which is what you don't want when things go bad. Very often in risk management, we want to check if a given risk measure we have computed makes sense or not for us. There are different ways for doing that. One of the simplest ones, and also one of the most common ones, is the so-called backtesting. Now, in backtesting, the idea is that we verify the performances of our risk measure looking at historical data. So we see, we check how the risk measure would have performed in the past. Consider, for example, a 99% valid risk. We want to verify how this value would have performed in the past using some historical observations that we have. In other words, what we do, we just count the number of days in the past in which the actual loss was higher than our 99% valid risk. If our valid risk is reliable, what we would expect is to observe only 1% of losses above that level, so 1% of exceptions. If we assume to have a certain number of days and we make the simplifying assumption for the moment that the different days are independent, in every day I have a certain probability of observing an exception, that is to say a loss above my valid risk. If I consider my n days, what I can expect is that 1 minus alpha percent of the observations, if my valid risk is correct, lie above the threshold, so above the valid risk. And alpha percent will lie below. Now, it is not difficult to see that if we assume the dependence of the days, as we were saying a second ago, we are essentially playing with a Bernoulli trial. So the distribution of the critical value that we will essentially check is a binomial distribution. Using a binomial test, like those that you have learned in your basic courses in statistics, we can easily backtest valid risk. So we want to backtest the 98% valid risk of a portfolio on gold. We have 1,200 days of data and we observe 20 exceptions. We set the significance level for the test to be 5%. Should we reject valid risk? Yes or no? Here we can distinguish different situations. 
Typically, uh, the idea is to compare the number of expected exceptions and the number of observed exceptions. Now, if the number of expected exceptions is larger than the number of observed exceptions, we are possibly overestimating the risk. Statistically speaking, we have to perform a left tail test. So we will have to look at the left tail of the binomial distribution. If, conversely, the number of expected is smaller than the number of observed exceptions, we are in the opposite situation, so we are possibly underestimating the risk. And in terms of binomial tests, we have a right tail test. Coming back to our example, this is a case of possible overestimation of that risk, is a left tail test, and we simply look at the value of the binomial distribution computed in the different parameters of the text of the example. And obviously, given the p value that we observe, we do not reject the null hypothesis that for us is that our valid risk is reliable. So we do not reject our valid risk. In this second example that you see on your screen, we are conversely possibly underestimating valid risk. And if we compute our p-value, we observe that actually we have to reject the null hypothesis. So our valid risk is not reliable. There are obviously other tests that can be used to backtest valid risk. One example is the test by Kupiak. For the test by Kupiak, I refer you to the reading materials of this lesson.